Welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church Online. My name is Marian Brown, one of the associate pastors, and this is our on-demand version of the sermon that will be preached on this Sunday morning. And please know that our Sunday services will be live streamed beginning at 9 a.m. for the contemporary service and 11.15 for the traditional service. If you would like to have the entire worship experience on demand, that will be available on Monday morning. We appreciate you being a part of our online community and we invite you to be active and participate through your giving. And so we thank you for your support and your generosity. Before we listen to this Sunday sermon, let's have a moment of prayer. Gracious and holy Lord, we ask that you remind us that wherever we are, we are on holy ground. And so may you help us make space. So may we receive a message that you have for us in this moment. Be in our hearts so that it's open. Be in our ears so that they are open and be a part of our lives so that we are open to receive a challenge and an invitation. Work within us now and all around us so that we may know your presence and we may feel it fully. Through a moment now of words and scripture, speak to us, amen. Let's listen to this Sunday sermon. Welcome. My name is Jeff Ross, and I'm one of the associate pastors here at the Roswell United Methodist Church. Thanks for tuning in to this time of worship. Our scripture today is from the sixth chapter of Isaiah, verses 1 through 8. And it says there, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two wings they flew. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. <laughs> and I cried, woe to me, for I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from, with tongs from the altar. And with it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day, for your word, for the opportunity we have today to uh, just ponder this passage and your presence uh, in our lives. And we just ask God that you would meet us here, that you would guide us, that you would help us to see you and help us to see uh, your word in us. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, bless you. It's good to see, be here today. It's good to have this time uh, of worship. I want to dive into this passage a little bit and look at it. Um, where you are listening today, it may not be Memorial Day weekend, but as I record this, uh, this is Memorial Day weekend. So uh, I'll be kind of thinking about that in the background of this scripture and uh, tying that together a little bit. And so, 
I'm struck with this phrase in verse 5. Woe to me, or woe is me, uh, I am ruined. And I'm, I'm pondering Isaiah's uh, use of that uh, because uh, he, he says this phrase in response to this vision of something amazing and the, uh, the sound of the choir saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Um, that, that doesn't seem to conjure up woe to me. That doesn't seem like something we should pull back from or be afraid of, but it, it sounds just the opposite, like something we should be moving towards, uh, not away from. Well, you know, uh, as you look at this passage and the wording, uh, there's an interesting uh, uh, book that came out a few years ago that's called Woe Is I. And the subtitle is A Grammar Phobe's Guide to Better English in Plain English. And the writer says, shouldn't it be woe am I, or better yet, I am woe? Uh, the, the book had some interesting points and became a bestseller. And so just a couple of years ago, they came out with Woe is I for Junior, uh, a book for students, elementary uh, kids. Um, Woe is Me is also an American metalcore band from Atlanta, Georgia. And so not far away from, from here. It was formed in 2009, paused a little bit, uh, and then has uh, come back and started working again. Um, you know, the, the phrase, woe is me, doesn't mean me and woe are the same thing. But rather, woe is to me, or woe is unto me, or woe has come upon me. Um, and so th that is a, a, a phrase that's used a, a good bit when we uh, have something we're worried about. And, um, and, and it's become such a part of our language that there's a, a new phrase that's going around uh, that's called woe is me-ing, M-E-I-N-G, woe is me-ing. Uh, which is a new word or phrase, uh, and it, it might be used in the sentence, I'm getting so tired of Bob, woe is me all the time. <laughs> uh, you know people like that, that just things aren't going well, they're running away from things that maybe they should be embracing, uh, their outlook on life is negative instead of positive. And so that's what I want to kind of dive into today with this, with this passage. Why is Isaiah woe is me all the time? What's gotten him woeful? Uh, why the long face? What's taking place? What's going on? Well, in the text, we know uh, from the first chapter of Isaiah, first verse, that uh, Isaiah is the son of Amoz. And he saw visions, or he was a prophet, under four kings. And so uh, th this passage that we've read today, uh, chapter 6, starting with verse 1, uh, talks about the end of the reign of one of those kings, Uzziah. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died. And so why is, is that woeful? Well, in a word, Jotham uh, Jotham was the son of Uzziah. He's the one that was uh, supposed to take over. Uzziah had been a good, strong uh, king for 52 years. So for a, a, a whole generation of people, they hadn't known anything but Uzziah as the king. And anytime there's change, it's time for a little anxiety. Uh, what's going to happen? And there was not a lot of confidence in Jotham. He wasn't the kind of person that you would pick uh, as a king. And one of the biggest problems was Assyria, a large nation with a big army uh, that was just to the north. Uh, and Jotham didn't seem to be the kind of match uh, that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with uh, uh, Assyria and come out on top. So there was a whole lot of restlessness, a whole lot of ambiguity concerning what was about to happen. 
Who will be the new king? What will he be like? What will his plans be? Who will he favor? What will Isaiah's relationship be like with him? Will Isaiah be on the inside or the outside? So Isaiah's anxious. People are anxious. It's similar to right now, right? An election year. Uh, what's going to happen? If this happens, what will happen? If that happens, what will happen? What, where's the country going to go? Suffice it to say, Isaiah was pretty anxious. Um, he was full of woe. And so, again, in the year that King Uzziah died, getting back to chapter, uh, verse 1 of the sixth chapter, it's the year of Uzziah's death, but this anxiety wasn't brought on all of a sudden by a, 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 a death that was unexpected. Uzziah, as we find out back in 2 Kings chapter 15, had leprosy. And so people had been aware for a while that uh, Uzziah's days were, were numbered. And so this restlessness wasn't something sudden brought on by a quick change, a death of Uzziah. It had been going on for a while. And so that kind of tension, anxiety, uh, fear uh, wears you down after a while. And so Isaiah's been pondering these what-ifs, he's been woeful, uh, he's been wondering what's going to happen, and so it's no wonder that he's dreaming. And it's out of this dream of anxiety, anxiousness, that he has this amazing vision of God sitting on a throne. It's a grand and powerful vision, uh, holy, magnificent. Uh, the seraphs were in attendance. Um, they, uh, they call to reinforce, they're called or brought in to reinforce the, the theme of God's power and might and holiness. Uh, the earth is full of God's glory. Now, even as he sees this vision or dreams this vision, the doorposts shake. There's a mighty uh, wind and shaking and the, the temple house is filled with smoke. Um, and so I, I got to ask, I wonder, are, are you restless right now? We talked about the election already. What about uh, the economy, uh, your family, uh, relationships that you have, your spiritual life? Is there any sense of anxiety, restlessness, wonder, fear uh, that's taking place? Uh, and as you ponder those things, are you, are you leaning into them or leaning away from them? Do they cause you to step back or do they cause you to sort of lean into it? And so all of this has taken place in Isaiah's life. Uh, and this presence of God is a powerful image in this dream. And so it's interesting Isaiah's response. Uh, to me, I, th I think it's pretty interesting. In the presence of God, Isaiah doesn't feel joy. You know, if you were anxious, I was anxious. If things weren't going right and God showed up, that, wouldn't there be a sense of peace, of hope? Oh, good. Hey, God, we were sort of wondering where you were in all of this. It's glad that you're here. Hey, I got a few questions for you. But that's not the case at all, is it? Uh, Isaiah uh, has this vision of, of God uh, and um, when, when, uh, and, and God shows up in this vision and he feels automatically, he just jumps right to his feelings of sinfulness, of shame, of uncleanness, uh, the weight of the sin of his whole community. He talks not only about his sin, but the sins of the community. You know, it kind of reminds me uh, of this pet peeve that I have uh, is the signs that you see all around, Jesus is coming, repent. What? <laughs> and so we're, we're trying to reach a world that's lost, and that's what we come up with. Jesus is coming. Be afraid. Jesus is coming. He's going to get you. Jesus is coming. He's out to find whatever it is that you're doing wrong and punish you for it. Jesus is coming. Repent. Oh my gosh, is, is that good news? Is that helpful to anybody? Where, where does that theology uh, even come from? Why the negative? Why the woe? Shouldn't it be Jesus is coming? Celebrate! Shouldn't it be Jesus is coming? Rejoice! That should be good news. 
And in this story we find in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah has this incredible vision and his first action is to step back, to cower in shame and fear. God's showed up and he knows all the bad stuff I've ever done and he's here to punish me for it. Uh, it, you know, if you read through the Bible, you find that just about every instance where God shows up, where the angels show up, the very first words out of their mouth are, don't be afraid. Uh, on Christmas Eve, uh, with Mary, with uh, other folks, uh, the angels show up, and, and their first word is, don't be afraid, because they can see that we're afraid. It... it um, I don't know, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. I don't see the Gospels telling us to be afraid. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 16, says, be at peace. I have overcome the world. Don't be full of woe. John 12, 47 says, I didn't come to judge the world but to save the world. But yet, when we hear the name of Jesus or see a vision of God, our first reaction is to be woeful, to step back. Uh, so, seeing Isaiah's woe, it's amazing all through the scripture how God tailor makes a response uh, to get at where we really need uh, the most help. Look at what God does. Uh, Isaiah says, woe is me for I'm a man of unclean lips and we are a people of unclean lips. And so the seraph gets a set of tongs, go gets a coal off of the altar, the, uh, the uh, altar table, uh, and he comes out and he touches Isaiah's lips. He says, I am a man of unclean lips. I, have, I, have, I, have, I am unclean. And, and so uh, Isaiah has uh, experienced in this vision his own sin, his own worthiness, his own lack, uh, the, the things that he falls short of. He doesn't feel worthy to stand in the presence of God. But God comes to him right at the place where he says he, he's the, the worst off, his lips. And God comforts him, saves him, redeems him, uh, lifts him up, touches him. It's powerful. It's, it's just like um, when Jesus encounters the leper. The leper is someone who can't be touched, embraced uh, by the community. They're unclean. They're supposed to ring a bell, stay away. Jesus touches the leper. He could have healed the leper in a hundred different ways, but he touches the leper because the, the thing that the leper probably has missed the most is someone's touch. When uh, Jesus comes back a second time to 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 Thomas, when Jesus kneels on the coastline with Peter, <laughs> he's coming right at their uh, uh, place of vulnerability uh, to offer grace in a way that's dramatic. So we shy away from God because of our own sense of restlessness. It's, it's our fault. It's on us. It's not on God. We're projecting all of that onto God. We're projecting our pride, our anger, our acting out, our addiction, our lust, whatever it is, we're projecting that off and feel like God's here uh, to, uh, to beat us up for that. And so we do the one thing we shouldn't do. We, we try to turn away. We, we try to leave. But the, the wonderful, beautiful thing about God is that God pursues us. As Isaiah is turning away, stepping back, oh, what does God do? He comes with the, the, the hot coal to touch his lips. But all through the Bible, we see the, the inclination to run away. Jonah, Isaiah here, uh, Peter does that, Paul does that. Um, we, we see this uh, action of God and we, we run away. We've been conditioned to think that our, 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 our restlessness is our fault. We've done something, we've sinned, we've made God mad uh, and we're not worthy 
uh, through our own work uh, to make up for that. We're flawed. But isn't that what uh, Jesus' work on the cross is all about? And so in, in verse 8, the story takes a big turn. Uh, Isaiah's been afraid, uh, but he's had this encounter with the living God, uh, and now he's at a different place, and God says, who will go for me? Who can I send? And, and uh, Isaiah steps up and says, God, send me. Send me. He's, he's made a turn. Uh, he's no longer afraid, but he's stepping into the blessing and the, uh, the invitation of God. And what if, what if we did that? What if we took all the energy we've been using to run away from God, hide from God, pretend God doesn't know what's going on with us? What if we used all of that energy to run towards God? Jesus, Jesus comes to tell us to repent. We're going the wrong way. Uh, but that's not a, a negative thing. That's not an angry, I'm going to get you thing. It's you're going the wrong way. Go this way. This is the way to life. Repent, the word, actually means just to turn uh, and, and follow him. You know, as we, uh, as I said in the beginning, as we celebrate Memorial Day this weekend, uh, I'm thankful, uh, and I think we all are, uh, to men and women who, when faced with an invitation, an encounter uh, w with, with God and faith and life and what they should do, uh, didn't run from the call to serve their country uh, because they didn't feel up to the challenge or equipped or, or able. They ran towards that and embraced it. Uh, and we have such a long history in our country of brave men and women who stepped up in the midst of a conflict and a battle uh, to say, uh, I may not have all the answers, but I can be a part of the solution. You know, God's not trying to catch us in some nefarious action uh, so that he can punish us. God actually is love. And the Bible says, God is love and in him there is no darkness at all. You and I might not have a, a grand vision like Isaiah, but God is all around us. God is here with us today. God is uh, in this uh, broadcast today. Uh, God is in our midst. God is seeking us and, and not to uh, beat us up, but to offer us hope and grace and life. You know, Jesus is coming. Let's celebrate. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for this day, for your grace and mercy. We thank you that you call us. You th we thank you that you do reveal yourself to us. Help us, God, not to run from that, but to lean into it, to uh, hope for it, to expect it, to uh, long for it and to embrace it when it comes. Thank you that Isaiah said, here I am, send me, I'll go, I'm, I'm willing, I'll, I'll jump in. Help us, God, in the ways in which you're leading and calling us to, to jump in, to be involved, to use the gifts you've given us and the energy that we have to be about your work and your kingdom. For it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for joining us online. It is a blessing to have the gift of technology to have sermon this way. We thank you for participating. And just a reminder, if you want to see the live services, 9 a.m. on Sunday for contemporary and 1115 Sunday morning for traditional services. And always we will have the full on-demand worship experience on Monday morning. And if there's ever a time that you would like to join us here at the physical location, we're located at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, Roswell, Georgia. We want to be connected with you. If you have a prayer request, please let us know by emailing pray at rumc.com. And we would love for you to be a part of our ministry through your giving. If you would like to support our campus and our ministries, you can do so at rumc.com slash give. And now hear these words 
of a benediction. Love without fear, serve with commitment, and in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.